What is the life cycle of a medical student or a doctor? Stress begins in the life of a medical student when your medical seat has to them, right? When you are attending coaching centers, when you are competing with each other to get into a prestigious medical institution and secure the future. Once you get into a medical college, maybe your parents may feel that oh, everything is solved. They have become a doctor now. What is the reality? Once you get into a medical any person can undertake in his lifetime. Of course, final year is going to be another major milestone and a very tough exercise. I remember with gratitude Professor M.K. Suresh who used to teach us basics of medicine during the final year in BBS days. I used to be an excellent student that I used to bunk classes during the third years. It was a very typical average medical student. When I reached final year, I understood with great pain that I did not know the basics of medicine. And Dr. Suresh was very caring to teach us the basics. We used to attend his clearing classes. We used to attend his clearing classes, which we used to take for third year in BBS. And I, as a final year student, used to go and attend his classes where he used to teach about mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, and all lot of things. And I owe a lot to this great man who continues to be so grounded and level-headed. And I was extremely happy to hear your applause when his name was announced. So, once a great man, always a great man. So, again, after you pass your MBBS, you feel that you have gained the privilege to use the stethoscope. You can treat and cure patients. You have become a doctor. Is life settled there? Now again, the next phase starts. The competition to get into a postgraduate seat. And even after gaining a postgraduate training seat, many postgraduates tell that postgraduate phase of training is a glorified phase of slavery. If any postgraduates are here in this auditorium, many of you may agree. Even after you get a postgraduate degree, you have to try for super speciality. And once you have completed a super speciality, innumerable number of fellowships in different parts of the world, finally you become a consultant. And once you become a consultant, it is very important to attract patients. Because just with half a dozen degrees, if you go and sit at a place, nobody is going to come to you. That starts another phase of intense stress and competition. And once you become a busy practitioner, what happens to a doctor is that they get cut off from the society. What is the most important factor which enhances the lifespan of a human being? Any idea? The most important factor which enhances the lifespan of a human being. Have you heard about Harvard Human Development Study? I'm sure you have heard about Harvard University, right? Undergraduate courses. They were interviewed about their childhood, their relationship with their parents, their peers, their siblings, their adolescents, their romantic affairs in life. And they were followed up throughout the course of education in Harvard. Even after they passed out, the interviewers used to go and meet them once in a year and follow up on what happened in their life till the point of their death. So the study is supposed to be the longest and largest study on human development ever undertaken anywhere in the world. It is 85 years, more than 30,000 people have participated in that study. And this Harvard Human Development Study has brought forth five important factors which enhance the lifespan of human beings. First four, all of us are aware, we talk about those four factors in our community medicine sessions in our outreach programs, in our health education sessions to the public. Number one, proper diet. Number two, regular exercise. Number three, abstaining from all kinds of tobacco products. Number four, abstaining from alcohol use. What's new? There is a fifth factor. And this fifth factor is the most important factor which enhances the lifespan of a human being. Can anybody guess it? Purpose of life, it's a slightly abstract thing because certain people get purpose of life by smoking cannabis, right? Certain others get purpose of life by harming their fellow beings. So let us be a little bit more concrete. 
What is the fifth factor? So we have got a perpetual gold medalist in front of us. Dr. K. Elizabeth, again, an alumnus of Medical College. Trudantum is a person who has won gold medals right from the first campaign till the end of her education. And I had a fortune of doing a talk in the Med Talk series in MedEx, which happened in 2016. And I was talking on improving study skills. And Dr. Elizabeth was sitting near me. And that happens to be a paradox. Many of my classmates still tease me that how dare you spoke about study skills and how to make studies easy when such an intellectual giant was sitting near you. And Madam has given the right answer as always. Quality of human relationships which you develop during your childhood, adolescence and youth. That is the single most important factor which enhances your lifestyle. If you think, it is very much understandable. Number one, if you have got great relationship with your parents, you are more likely to be taken care of as a child. You are less likely to die out of protein, energy, malnutrition or infections or such issues. During adolescence, if you have got a very positive group of friends, you are unlikely to get action as we go. Of 10 crore rupees, you are running to the bank to get that money. And in the process of running, your, your leg hits somewhere in this door. Very severe hit. Did you experience anything? Did you sit and cry? You continue to run, right? Another day, you get the news that a very near and dear person has expired. You are just walking to the place of the funeral. There is a phenomenon called somatosensory amplification. In somatosensory amplification, you have a lot of bodily sensations going through your body, but you single out one particular sensation, you attribute a catastrophic significance to it, and you panic. Maybe in the afternoon, after you have your lunch, there will be some mild burning sensation in the upper abdomen. Everybody goes through that. Nobody bothers about it. But maybe you have had a fight with one of your friends. You are in a low state of mind. You are sitting alone, you are brooding over what has happened. And a small sensation, you attribute a very dangerous significance to it. You feel that your heart is pounding, you are going to get a heart attack, you may fall down and die, and you become afraid. So this is somatosensory amplification. So your state of mind not only affects your mental health, it affects your physical health as well. Again, one very important point I want to communicate to you is, Building relationships and sustaining them is important, but how to build them and how to sustain them, and how to take care of your near and dear ones, even if it's your classmate or a close friend, when he is going through a moment of crisis. Let me ask you a simple question. A boy and a girl of your class, they are always enjoying each other's company, they come to college together, they talk to each other as if nobody else exists in this universe and they go from this college together. What do you call this relationship? I can't hear anything. I hope to gather a couple of new terminologies after the session so that I can talk to my students and try to make a so much about that. What is this relationship? Please tell something. You turn your own center. It's friendship. Is it friendship? Yes, it's friendship. Is friendship possible between a boy and a girl? It's very much possible. Friendship is one of the most beautiful things which can happen to us. So let me modify that question a little bit. One day, that girl is not coming to college. And that boy is appearing extremely restless. He's looking out of the window as if anticipating somebody's arrival. He's unable to focus on what is being taught. What is this relationship? I hope some new terminologies will come from your side. Nothing is coming. Okay. So let me talk about four or five simple English words and their dimensions in human life. Number one is friendship. 
What is the boundary of a healthy friendship? Do you like a person? That person likes you. You help that person, you receive help from that person also. But do you sit and cry if that person doesn't come to college? Do you sit and cry? No. You'll be thinking about that person. Why he hasn't turned up to me? But within a couple of one minutes, you'll be back to your normal self, you'll be doing your work. So you're bothered about that person, you're concerned about that person, but you are not emotionally affected by what he says, what he does, or whether he is present or absent. That is probably the boundary of a healthy friendship. Now we come to the next term, C-R-U-S-H. What is that? You might have seen Bollywood heroes giving interviews. My first crush was towards my teacher during my kindergarten days. Things like that, right? So what is this crush? You watch a movie, you see a particular actor who is very handsome or good looking. You don't know anything about that person. You don't know whether he has got discharged from mental hospital today morning before he acted in that movie. You don't know whether he is HIV positive. You don't know whether he is attracted. Just know that he is good looking. You absorb his figure into your mind and you develop an attraction or a liking towards him. And in the evening you go for a walk and you see another handsome man coming opposite you. The superstar is thrown out of the window and this youngster is internalized. So this is what is called crush. Crush is a transient temporary attraction you feel towards the external superficial attributes of the person. Who was the first superstar of Indian film industry? Who was the first superstar of Indian film industry? And the picture was Supporting actor in the movies in which this particular actor was a girl. If nobody answers, I hope Elizabeth Man will be giving the answer. <laughs> Not Chiranjeevi, slightly before that. After the Avadan. Who told that? So please give a very loud round of applause for sir. So the name of the most superstar of Indian film industry is Rajesh Khanna. How many of you have heard that no, name? Be truthful. The younger generation, how many of you have heard about Rajesh Khanna? Hardly two or three. So this is the plight of the first superstar of Indian film. So you can watch a particular song in YouTube, Loop Tera Mastana. It's a three and a half minute song in which the camera just follows the actor and the actors. No cut shots in between. You can see the expressions given by the actor, then you will realize why he became a superstar. He gave 15 hit films back to back, probably an unparalleled record in the history of not only Indians in our world cinema. But what happened to that great superstar? Superstardom went to his head. He started hitting the bottle. He started coming to the sets inebriated, intoxicated, and he started sleepwalking through the roads. He started reporting to the sex fashionably late and however talented you are, unless you maintain discipline and professionalism, you are going to be out of your field. That is what Rajesh Khanna's experience teaches you. Within five to six years, Rajesh Khanna was out of the superstar and a very tall, probably ugly looking actor who used to play supporting roles in the movies in which Rajesh Khanna was the hero became the next superstar. And that person is still acting at that year, year at 80 years of age. His appetite is positive, he has got nice thing and dance, but still one of the most sought out actors and his name is Amitabh Bachchan. So even in an industry where looks matter and talent matter, more than that, it is your attitude, it is your discipline, it is your professionalism which matters. Just what you have learned from Rajesh Khanna's experience. Now we come to the third term, N-U-S-T, lust. What is that? Everybody knows the meaning, but nobody will be confident in it. There is a peculiarity of that term. It's sexual attraction you feel towards somebody. It's okay to have that feeling, but you should ensure that your lust is not going to become a pain either for you or for another person. That is the responsibility you should have. Now we come to the fourth word, romance. What is romance? 
And my parents asked you today evening what was stopped in the class today morning at the college to tell that last romance took a little screen in the meeting. What is romance? Among lot of friends you have, one person becomes a special friend. You want to spend more time with that person. You like thinking about that person. Your entire world is centered around that person. If that person doesn't come to college one day, you become extremely restless because you are not sure about the longevity of this relationship. You are afraid that somebody may intrude into this relationship and ruin it for you. And again, when your special friend is talking to somebody else for 10 minutes continuously, again you will feel restless. Will that person go that way? So romance is an attachment which is based on intense amount of possessiveness, jealousy and insecurity. Now we come to the next term, which is a term which all of you know right from your first standard. The four letter word. What is that? This love. <laughs> hey, what is love? How is love different from romance? If you say that you are in love with somebody, and strongly in love with a person, if you say that, three questions for you. Number one. If the person you love develops a severe mental illness and is he wandering around the streets, will you continue to love him just the same? If the person you love develops a HIV positivity not because of a fault of his, is reduced to a bundle of bones, will you continue to love that person again? If the person you love lands in jail again because of no fault of his, is sentenced to lifetime imprisonment, Will you continue to love that person? No answer. <laughs> if the answer to all these three questions is a very strong yes, then you are in a state of love. So what is meant by love? Love is a state in which you are able to accept a person with all his shortcomings, all his deficiencies, all his disabilities, and all his failures make him a part of your life, hold that person's hand and help him get out of the crisis in which he is employed. That is love. Okay, but is it possible at this age? It's time to think because what is the visual imagery which comes to your mind when you hear the word love? We think in visuals, right? When you hear a word, some visuals appear in our mind. What is the visual which comes to your mind when you hear the word love? Switzerland. Alps Mountains, Yash Chopra Lake, different types of Thaludas, unlimited amount of money, unlimited freedom, and absolutely no responsibility. That is probably the adolescent concept of love. But essentially, love is a state in which you have tremendous responsibility for that person. Mother and father. Mother and baby. So, definitely it's a state in which we have tremendous responsibility towards another person. Are we able to take up such kind of a responsibility at this stage of your life? Are you? Slightly difficult, right? The reason is that what's the biggest setback you had in your life till now? Did you come across any setbacks in your life? Of course, every person might have come across it. What is the biggest setback you had in your life till now? Probably you wanted Apple 15 and it, you did not get it immediately, right? Or maybe you wanted to study in a particular college and you did not get admission to that. Is it? Of course. But do you think that it's a very serious setback that your life is going to be ruined? You have got admission to one of the most prestigious medical, illustrious medical teachers in front of you. And they are probably the best in India. So you need not worry about the academic part of your life at all. Because you have got the best teachers. But again, after a few years, certain things can happen in your life. Certain people close to you may have certain illnesses. They may die. And it is after those experiences that you understand the true meaning of what love is. Because one of the major purposes of life, I am coming to the term purpose of life, one of the major purposes of life 
is to master the art of receiving and giving love. By love, I don't mean a romantic kind of a love, a pure kind of an affection you feel towards another person. If you are a master at receiving and giving love, half of the purpose of your life is served. I believe it. But again, all these states of mind are okay. But there is a final dangerous state of mind in relationships. We call it as emotional slavery. Can you live just by talking to one human being for the entire duration of your life? Just by talking to one fellow and cut off from the entire world, will you be able to survive for the entire lifetime? It's not possible. But certain people will say that, yes, it is possible. I need only this person in my life. I don't want my parents, I don't want my siblings, I don't want my teachers, I don't want to talk to my brother, sister, anybody. I just want this person. We would like to go to some marooned island and survive there, just like Blue Lagoon. So the reality is that it is impossible to live like that. Because in human relationships, conflicts are bound to happen. Difference of opinion are bound to happen. Even between the closest of friends, who understand each other perfectly, there can be difference of opinions. So emotional slavery is a state in which you submit yourself absolutely to another person. You have heard the term toxic relationship, right? What is this toxic relationship? Because one of the important factors which drive a person to suicide is toxic relationships. There are four important elements for love or for any relationship. Number one is intimacy. Intimacy means you take decisions taking into account the interest of your lover also. Number two is passion. It's an attraction of beauty. It could be a sexual inclination. It could be very strong at the beginning of a relationship, but of course, as days go by, familiarity would definitely start breeding contempt and the intensity is going to be coming down. Third is commitment. Commitment means even after you are into a relationship, the meetings lot of great people who are intelligent, handsome, beautiful, good looking, who may influence. But the ability to keep healthy boundaries in all those relationships so that the primary relationship is not impaired, that is coming. And the fourth pillar of love is what is called democracy. And this democracy is important not only in love, in any kind of human relationship, democracy is important. What is democracy? Democracy is the right and ability of a person to express his opinion and his difference of opinions and to ensure that the other person listens to it at least. The other person need not agree to whatever you say, but he has the responsibility to listen to you. If the other person is not listening to you, he is condescending, he is dismissing of your opinions, then understand you are in a state of toxic relationships. If you are in a toxic relationship, you are likely to commit follies in relationship. Because there you have submitted yourself to that person, you have lost your self-esteem to such an extent that you just behave like an instrument which is being switched on and off by the other person. If that person asks you to go and die, you may not try to commit suicide. If that person asks to go to some place and cut off from your academics and your parents, you may just obey and believe it. This is an extremely unhealthy state of mind. So understand, love is a part of life, but not the heart of life. We need all human beings in our life. We need our parents. Because of course parents are going to be the only people who will be unconditionally accepting you when you go through the most difficult crisis in life. Am I right? Of course. You should understand. You should develop great friends because what is the advantage of having friends in a medical college? A few years back, I was in Bangalore for a conference and Sunday midnight, 12, I got a call from my wife telling that her father was 62 years of old at that point of time, is having severe chest pain, sweating, he is trembling like anything. Because Sunday midnight is the worst time for a person to get a myocardial infarction. Because most of the big hospitals, 
super specialists and other eminent specialists will not be there. Junior doctors will be there. And maybe cardiologists may be touring somewhere. And to get his attention, it's really, really difficult. So I was in a fix because I was not there. I was in a very distant place. And only my wife, her sister, and the father was there. So I just needed to think for one minute before I picked my phone and telephoned my MBBS batch mate, a cardiologist, who is practicing into that. And just two rings at 12.30 night, he picked up my call and asked me, Andre, I told him that this is a crisis. I just want you to get an advice regarding what I should do and how to go forward. Oh, why do you need to ask these kind of questions? Bring him to the hospital straight away. I'll be there in 15 minutes. And it was just like, you know, a godsend kind of a message. I communicated this to my wife who could not believe it. He was, she was asking me, are you in your senses or are you inebriated? I told them, no, my friend has promised help. And they reached the hospital within 30 minutes and the cardiologist was very much there, fully waiting for the patient there. And at 1.30 a.m. an angiogram was done. There was a 98 percent block in one of the major arteries to the heart. A primary angioplasty was done and the patient was stabilized. The only reason was that this particular young man, this cardiologist, my friend, he's from Kochi. He used to stay in hostel during our student days. Once my friend developed a severe fever, his platelet started dropping down and he was terribly, terribly ill. Within two days, I asked him just to move to my house. And he came and stayed at my house for 10 days. And my mother used to take care of him for the entire 10 days. We never knew that this person was going to become a cardiologist in life and was going to help. But just, you know, the art of giving and taking love. That is just that. Unconditionally we did that. We never knew that this person is going to stay to remain in Trivandrum because his native place in Kochi. So most probably he would have gone there and practiced there or he would have gone abroad. That was what we used to think at that point of time. But if you give care and affection to a person, it is going to be reciprocated at some point of time in life. Have you heard about first aid? Have you heard about first aid? Have you heard about mental health first aid? Anybody who has heard about the term mental health first aid, please raise your hands. First aid is something which we do to stabilize the medical condition of the person who has gone through some physical problems before he is taken to a hospital. So like that, in 2016, the World Health Organization proposed the concept of mental health first aid. Mental health first aid is a way in which you can stabilize the mental health of any person in your vicinity. Maybe your batchmate, your family member, your neighbor, or anybody under your control who is going through some emotional stress in life. If you find any of your friends are going through this kind of an emotional stress, there are five simple things you are supposed to do. And these five things constitute what is meant by mental health first aid. Maybe you see that your friend is not talking to you as you should or that person is remaining immersed in thought for a long period of time or she is crying for no reason or is getting irritated for trivial reasons which is very unlike his baseline behavior in these are the situations in which we should use mental health first aid so there are five simple things number one approach the person who is in distress and proactively ask him what is trouble most importantly, you know, people of your age, do you love to open up to others? No. Maybe these females may open up to some trustworthy friends. What about this section of the society? Do you feel like opening up about your problems? Have you heard about toxic masculinity? Toxic relationships we have discussed. And what is this toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity is a concept which originated in West, but unfortunately, we have also imbibed it in a large way. The toxic masculinity means to be a typical male, you need to be nothing short of a he-man. 
You should never accept that you are going through a painful situation. You should tolerate any kind of physical. You never take treatment for a mental health issue. That is toxic masculinity. So what happens these days is that we get to read a lot of news in the newspapers about adolescents falling from tops of flats and dying. Drowning in sea. Meeting with accidents while traveling on the road. Many of them look and sound like accidents, but believe me, having talked to many of these family members, I understand that many of these incidents are suicides masquerading as accidents. Because committing suicide again is a sign of weakness according to the philosophy of toxic masculinity. So even if you feel like dying, you should engineer it in such a way that it looks like an accident. And that way of organizing it in such a way is convenient for a lot of people. Because even for parents, you know, if a child has died through suicide, a stigma is an accident. It's an accidental death. The entire society will sympathize with it. And just talking about this concept of toxic masculinity, because I find Boys of the adolescent age have great difficulty in opening up about their problems. Please don't. It's a humble request. If you feel that something is affecting you, if you feel that you're right, what, is, what do you mean by your dustbin? You may be spilling all our filth into that dustbin, but that dustbin will make sure that it is not leaked out anywhere. Right? So, a good friend is a person who has the capacity to maintain confidentiality and keep whatever you say right. So a good friend has five qualities essentially. He'll be a good listener. He'll be able to listen to whatever you say non-judgmentally. He'll never trivialize your problems. He'll never make fun of you. He'll never scold you. He'll never intrude when you're speaking. He'll be completely listening patiently till the end. Whatever you are saying, even if it is the silliest thing in the world. A good friend should be a good listener. A good friend should be a good dustbin. Number three, a good friend should have the attitude of helping you whenever he or she can. So approach the person who is in this person and ask him or ask her, what is troubling you? Seems that you are not in a positive state of mind. Is there something bothering you? Never feel shy to ask such a question to anybody in your vicinity who seems to be distressed. Number two, the second step of mental health first aid is listen. Non-judgmental listening. We say, I say that you know whenever people with family issues and conflicts come to me, certain husbands tell me that, you know, my wife is grating on my nerves, demanding hundreds of things which I cannot satisfy. How can I survive this? I tell them that there is a very effective therapy called mm, mm, therapy. Mm. 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 So even if, if you are in a long distance relationship, through the mobile it is very convenient, right? You can do your job and in between frequent intervals. Mm. Hmm, it'll be okay. So that is probably the art of listening. So listen, don't intrude, don't start giving advices. I'm sure that one of the major complaints telling, see, you are not the first idiot who is pursuing MBBS course in this college or in this world. There have been people who were, you know, even bigger fools than you, but they have all survived. They have become great people serving in different parts of the world. Nobody likes to hear that, right? So don't advise, just listen. Just listen patiently without judging the person because what he says may not be something which subscribes to our moral standards, religious points of view, etc. Still, find some time to listen patiently. That is step number two. Step number three is give information and reassurance. Maybe when you understand that that person is going through a problem because he has misunderstood something. Correct that factual misunderstanding. Clear that misunderstanding and tell that this is not the reality. The reality is something else. Maybe because that person is sad that a batchmate is not talking to him because of some reason he has made up in his mind. 
tell them that that's not the reality. If your friend, a good friend for so many years is not smiling at you one morning, what is the most important possibility? What is the possibility? That a very close friend used to exchange person please every morning, but one morning you smile at that person, he knows you or she knows you. What are the possibilities? Immediately we start thinking that, you know, that person is arrogant. So our mind starts fuming about ways to how to harm him or teach him a lesson. Or maybe you may start criticizing yourself, thinking that probably you have done something wrong to that person. That is the reason why he is not behaving well. Both need not be wrong. There could be a third reason behind. Maybe that person is going through some personal crisis which is absolutely unrelated to you. Is it possible? Maybe his father has been diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. It's a severe condition. And he doesn't feel like opening it to you at that point of time. In such a frame of mind, even if you are the closest friend, even if you smile at that person or talk in the sweetest way possible, person may not feel like reciprocating, just understand that. So that is the third step. Give information and correct misconception. And sometimes there will be certain big realities, big crisis situation in their life, which requires some attention. Just like I told you, your friend's father has been diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, with metastasis, and it cannot be cured in any way. What do you say to such a person? You say that it's okay. Don't bother about it. Is it okay to tell like that? What should you tell to such a person? What you can tell is that just you can hold that person's hands and tell them, whenever you need me, I'm here for you. That is reassurance. Whenever you need me, whenever you need my help, I'm here for you. I'll be there for you. I'll be trying to help you in the best possible way within my limitations. That is reassurance. So these are the first three steps. Approach, listen, give information and reassurance. Still, even after these three steps, if still the person is going through a difficult phase, is crying, is unable to communicate, then we have the fourth step. And the fourth step is encourage professional help. Just consult a psychiatrist who is there in your institution. Of course, there will be student support systems in all colleges as mandated by most of the universities. You can go and talk to the person who is in charge of the student support cell or you can go directly to the department of psychiatry and talk to any person. I am sure that most of the teachers will be student friendly. They would love to help students because they see you as their own miniature replicas. When I see you, I can think about the good old days in which I used to sit in big halls like this and, and uh, suffer intolerable lectures given by people you know, like this. I can understand that. I can probably empathize with you. So I'm sure that your teachers will also be able to empathize with you. Find out a person who you are comfortable with, a professional, a mental health professional. Talk to that person and get treated for whatever distress you are going through. And finally, the fifth step is what is called encourage social support. From the Harvard study, we have understood the importance of social connections, right? If a person appears to be distressed, don't isolate that person. That is your responsibility as peers. Maybe that person is not behaving positively to you. He is trying to show you off. He may be going through a phase of aloneness which he misunderstands as loneliness. What is the difference between loneliness and aloneness? It is said that loneliness is most often aloneness misunderstood. What is the difference between these two? In loneliness, the society is isolating you. Nobody is willing to talk to you and there are nobody available to help you. In aloneness, you are isolating yourself from the society. Even when there are 100 people around you willing to help you, you don't identify them as helpful and you cut off them. So that is why if a person is depressed, he may be going through the space of aloneness. You should understand that. He will not entertain you. She will not entertain you. 
even if you try to help okay go to help i know how to manage myself that's going to be the spontaneous reaction but understand that it is the reaction of a depressed mind this is not because they don't like you not because they hate you not because they are arrogant it is a reaction of a depressed mind how do you identify whether a person is going through depression in life this is very important because WHO has very clearly stated that depression is the most widely prevalent, easily preventable cause of suicide worldwide. It simply means that if you identify and treat depression, just keep this in mind. Even if you don't take home anything else from this session, just these nine symptoms of depression. Number one, you are feeling continuously sad right from morning to evening for two weeks continuously. Nothing excites you. You are unable to enjoy anything at all. You feel very dull and sad right from morning to evening. And that sadness, mind you, is not related to a particular situation, event, circumstances, or a person. It is continuously present. Number two, inability to enjoy, inability to demonstrate interest in previously pleasurable activities. You used to hang out with friends, go and play football in the evening, watch movies, chat with your friends. You don't feel interested in doing any of these things. You don't feel interested in coming to college. You don't feel interested in reading anything. That is the second important sign of depression. Third one is unexplained fatigue. You don't feel like getting up in the morning. You feel like sleeping the whole day, but you're unable to sleep. You're just lying in bed. That is the third one. Number four is sleep disturbance. Most often, the sleep disturbance of depression starts as early morning awakening. You wake up at least two hours before your usual time of waking up. You have the habit of waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning. If your sleep is disturbed before 4 a.m., when you are unable to complete your sleep, not because you are purposefully waking up, still you are waking up without any intention to wake up at that time, understand that you are moving into a depressive phase. And when depression becomes complete, Total sleep deprivation happens. And fourth one is appetite disturbance. You don't feel like eating even your choicest food items. And in some adolescent females, the reverse of this happens. Stress eating. Have you heard about that? Whenever you are feeling stressed, you purchase a family pack of ice cream and finish it off in 30 minutes. And what happens? Then you will go to sleep. You may not sleep comfortably, you will be lying down. Your physical activity is going to be very less. You will be slowly growing parallel to the surface of the earth. Your menstrual periods will become disturbed. You will develop cysts in the periphery of your ovary. That is called polycystic ovarian syndrome. All these metabolic complications can be there. Number five, the fifth one is Reduced concentration. You are unable to focus on what you are trying to read because a lot of slow. Somebody is asking you a question, you take a long time to reply. Somebody is asking you a favor, you take a long time to reciprocate. That is the sixth one. Next one is depressive thoughts. Depressive thoughts means there are different kinds of depressive thoughts at different levels. During the initial phase of depression, you feel hopeless. You feel that there is no future for you. Life is going on just like that. Absolutely nothing is looking good for you. That kind of a thought. When it becomes a little bit more advanced, you feel helpless. You feel that nobody is understanding you. There is nobody to help you. Everybody has isolated you and you are alone. And at a later stage, you start developing inappropriate guilt feelings. You feel guilty about normal things. Maybe you have shouted at your mother. Very understandable during adolescent age. But once you become depressed, you may you may attach inappropriate guilt to that. You think that since I have shouted at my mother, I have committed some grave crime and God has punished me for that. And you think like that. Finally, when depression becomes intense, you will feel worthlessness. You will feel that you are a burden to your family, you are a headache to your friends and you are better off from this world. And once you start thinking in that direction, what is the next spontaneous step? That is the ninth sign of depression. That wishes suicide.
So if anybody has five out of these nine things, that person is going through depressive disorder requiring treatment. So there are different phases of treatment, different ways in which you can be treated. If it is mild depression, just by psychological interventions, by talking to somebody, you can get an improvement. But in severe depression, you may need medicines because people who have gone through severe depression, they have described their experience like they are walking through a very dark, endless tunnel. They are walking with the hope that there will be light somewhere. But they continue to walk and walk and walk and there is absolutely no sight of light. And after a point of time, you become hopeless and give up. That is the experience of going through severe depression. So this severe depression, it is the result of certain neurotransmitter changes in the brain and certain medications can correct the level of the altered neurotransmitters and cure it. Remember, 80% of depression can be completely cured with nine months of treatment. That is the reality. So of course, whenever you feel that you are extremely low, don't think that this is the end of life. There are different ways to get out of it. Get a professional help. And whenever you feel low, open up to somebody near you. And whenever you feel that one of your friends is going through a distressed phase of life, just inquire with that person what is troubling you. So let us come to the last phase of my talk about finding purpose of life. I would like to narrate an experience which I had so many years back, around 10 years back. I had gone to Kochi to give a talk about a similar topic to a group of school students, 10th standard, 11th standard, 12th standard students. It was a uh, it was very, you know, what do you call it, school in which only very affluent people used to study, huge fees and things like that. After my talk, one of the girls studying the 10th standard asked me a question, Sir, what can I do to get happiness in life? If I am given this topic and asked to talk like this for one hour, I can cook up some stories and entertain you like this. But to answer it in a single sentence, it's really difficult. So I was scratching my head regarding what I should tell and finally found out an answer and told them, all right, to get happiness in life, you can compromise your luxuries without sacrificing your basic necessities to provide for the basic necessities of some of your unfortunate fellow beings. The very convoluted answer, I spoke in the fastest possible pace so that the girl would run away. But you know, you people are much more intelligent than us. What happened? The girl looked at my eyes and asked me the next question. Sir, tomorrow is my birthday. My mom has promised me a galaxy to have worth rupees 40,000. I wish to sacrifice that. How can I get happiness by sacrifice? It was a very specific and pinpointed question. These kind of sugar-coated philosophies will not survive in front of such pinpoint. But again, before I came to that school, I visited another institution. Anybody from Kochi in this crowd? Yeah. In Kochi, there is a government general hospital which has got a cancer ward. And around 20 people, 20 to 25 patients were there at that point of time. And the person in charge of the cancer ward was my senior in medical college to Vandor. He invited me to visit that ward. The reason was that these 25 people remaining in the cancer ward were extremely poor people from the lowest socioeconomic class. They had spent most of their money in different institutes treating cancer, but still the cancer was not cured. They never had any money remaining. So a charitable organization was sponsoring the chemotherapy medications for them, and they were getting medications. But that charitable organization had run into a financial problem, and they informed that they can no longer support the medications for these people. So within three days, the stock of chemotherapeutic drugs is going to stop. And the reason my friend called me was when I could help in generating some CSR funds, corporate social responsibility funds from certain agencies so that some medicines can be procured. So we were thinking about that and exactly at that moment, a 10-year-old boy was running around. Very good looking, charming boy, very talkative. He came to us, he took the stethoscope from my friend and started auscultating me and told us, Uncle, I also want to become a doctor. 
My friend pointed at him and told me, see, this boy is suffering from acute leukemia, which you know is a really difficult condition. He is improving, he is responding to treatment, but unless the medicines are made available, he is likely to die. So, kindly do something at least for this boy. I went to Kochi Info Park immediately after that. I used to go to take corporate training sessions in one of the companies there and I told the CEO there about this and they promised some help. But of course, these companies have a lot of prolonged, painfully slow paperwork before which money is sanctioned and we cannot wait for that. When this girl asked me this question, I want to sacrifice the galaxy tag. How can I get happiness out of it? I thought about that boy and the cancer boy. And I told that girl, Moen, to get happiness in life, just do one thing. Just go to this hospital, visit the cancer ward. If you can contribute the 40,000 rupees, which you have earmarked for buying galaxy there, to the patients there, maybe one or two people will get money to buy chemotherapy and their life can be saved. That would be a great thing to do. Okay, sir, she agreed, nodded her head and just went away. I did not take her seriously because, you know, after listening to these kind of talks, people may feel a little bit of high for five minutes. At the moment you watch the newest Instagram reel, everything would be out of your mind for sure. That's the reality. I did not take a serious course. I came back, I was sitting in my OP the next day and around 11.30, my friend, the cancer specialist from Bochi Court, we were very close. We used to make fun of each other right from our young days. So, was asking me, as per my instructions, a gang of 12 ladies have gathered there in the hospital. Last I told him that no, it was unlikely that 12 ladies would gather in such a place. It's very unlikely. And he told me what happened was that the particular girl I had talked to on the previous day, she went and visited the Lord. She identified the realities there, went back home, contacted 11 of her friends, discussed with her parents, and each of them contributed 42,000 rupees each, and a huge amount of 5 lakhs for handed over to the cancer specialist. So using that amount for the next 3 months, they could buy sufficient chemotherapeutic medications for those in need. I'm not saying that all the 25 people were saved because of this act of kindness. There would be definitely what you call a thorough kind of a statement. Nothing like that happened. The only thing was that that 10 year old boy with acute leukemia, he got completely cured. And two more things is that, you know, these are certain human beings which we meet once in a while in life. That girl who had contributed that much money and took the lead to organize that, she later became a medical student. She graduated last year. She invited me for a convocation and I traveled all the way from Toronto to the northern end of Kerala just to witness her becoming an art. And the best thing, and the best thing about it is that that 10 year old boy who had suffered from acute leukemia and got saved with this act of kindness, he is now pursuing medicine in another institution in Kerala. He's doing his third year at ABS and he is the chairman of the Blood Donors Club there. He's giving back to the society. He's ensuring that each and every batchmate of his is donating blood at least once in six months. That's the way in which you give back to the society the kindness you have received at one point of time. So these are certain examples of what we call finding purpose in life. I will wind up within the next seven minutes by talking about a person and a book which every one of you should read. The one book which every medical student should mandatorily read is Man's Search for Meaning. Have you heard that book? It was written by a very famous psychiatrist called Dr. Victor Frankl. Victor Frankl is probably the person who experienced unparalleled stress in his life. Because he was a youngster, he became very popular during his younger days itself as a psychiatrist. He married his longtime girlfriend, she became pregnant. 
They were living in a house in which Frankel's mother was there, his wife was there, and he was there. And he was having a lot of patience, he was a very popular person. But unfortunately, Victor Frankel happened to be a Jew. And he lived at a time in which Hitler was ruling over Germany. You understand that, right? So Hitler was very much against Jews, and he had this habit of arresting and confining Jews in whichever positions available to conservation camps. Exactly the same thing happened the, during the beginning of the Second World War time. The Nazi army invaded the place in which Victor Frankl was there. His wife was dragged into an uh, army van, and during that process, she had an abortion. And she was taken to a conservation camp. No treatment was given. She bled to death in the conservation camp. Mother was taken to another conservation camp. She developed typhus and died there. And Frankel was taken to a third conservation camp. You can imagine the life of that man, right? He's remaining at the pinnacle of success, very much celebrated, with everything intact in life. And he's losing every single thing he had achieved in his life. His dignity, his profession that is lost. His child is dead. His wife is dead. His mother is dead. He becomes absolutely isolated. So he was remaining in conservation camp and the conservation camps have got a peculiar structure. Very small cell rooms with 12 steps. And in each of these steps somebody would be lying down. And not only lying down, urinating, defecating, everything is carried out there. So that the urine and fecal matter deposited by somebody at the topmost step would be rolling down at night and falling on your head. Frankel describes the situation as repugnant to the level of exhaustion. Such an intolerable situation. Minus 30 degrees Celsius temperature. And in that extremely cold environment, you are not allowed to wear clothes also. That is the scenario of the conservation. Of course, there are situations where we are not given physical freedom. This is a typical example, right? But you can express your mental freedom by yawning, by staring at me, making faces, laughing, smiling, anything, right? But in this conservation camp, there was a peculiar rule. You are not allowed to cry. If you cry, the Nazi soldiers would come with their big gun and give you four blows on the lower jaw. That is the punishment for crying. So when this young Victor Frankl is remaining in the conservation camp, to think about his wife, about his son who was aborted, about his mother who expired, and his eyes would well up with tears, and every time he started to cry, the Nazi soldiers would come running and asking, do you want to get four blows? That is the reality. It was in this situation that Frankl had an experience which enlightened him about a third type of freedom, which is more powerful than physical and mental freedom. One morning, everybody were waiting for the breakfast. In conservation camps, you are given food only twice a day. Morning breakfast, one bowl of soup. Evening, before dinner, you are again given one bowl of soup. That's it, nothing else. In the morning, everybody waiting in queue with a bowl to get soup. There was a 75-year-old man, the eldest inmate of that jail. He went with the soup to the person there, and the Nazi soldier felt something mischievous. He took the soup, and instead of pouring it into the bowl, poured it over that elderly man's head, and asked him to just lick it from your head and eat it. The man was crying, and sick, and having a lot of illness. If I don't get food, I fall down and die. He was crying, pleading, literally begging with the soldier. The soldier was threatening him. Do you want to get blows on your lower jaw? And he was shooing that man away. The elderly man in extremely cold environment was just walking away, wailing and crying about his plight. Everybody standing there, including Victor Frankl, wanted to help this man somehow, but they had absolutely no idea what to do. They were staring at each other because they were afraid that if they go and talk to this person, maybe the Nazi soldiers would open fire and kill them. It was at that point of time that the youngest inmate of that tree, six-year-old boy, he came with his bowl of soup. It was his turn to get soup. 
collected the bowl of soup and without any confusion just went near that elderly man and handed this bowl of soup to him. Told, I don't have anything else to eat, but you be happy. That is a statement made by a six-year-old boy. The elderly man drank the bowl of soup and with shaking, trembling hands, was blessing the young boy by touching his head. It was at that moment that Frankel realized that there is a third freedom, bigger than physical and mental freedom, and this is called attitudinal freedom. You have heard the term attitude, right? Everybody tells that you should have an attitude in life, positive attitude in life. What is attitude? Attitude is the ability and courage to take decisions and implement them in the most difficult, unforeseen circumstances in life. Even if you are going through the most difficult situation, what is the most appropriate decision? The ability to take that and the ability to implement that. So that is attitudinal freedom. Frankel says that, this is one statement which I want to take home, you know, I want you to take home. Frankel says that, between a stimulus and your response to stimulus, there is a time gap. This time gap gives you enough time to think about the various ways in which you can respond to that stimulus and select the most useful and appropriate one. The ability to utilize this time frame appropriately determines your growth as a human being. This is what Frankel said. Just because somebody has shouted at you it doesn't mean that you should go and die. Just because somebody has called you by nickname, you need not punch him on the face. So between that stimulus and between your response to stimulus, there is this time frame. You can think about 100 possible ways to respond to that stimulus. And the ability to apply your thought, decide what is best for you, and to utilize the best response, that determines your growth as a human. I wind up with one more experience, again from Victor Frankl. This is not written in his autobiography, but this was something which Victor Frankl told in an interview years later towards the fag end of his life. So after Second World War, Victor Frankl was freed from the concentration camp. By that time he had lost everything, but he started rebuilding his practice. He went on to write this book, Man's Search for Meaning. He developed a psychological treatment called Logotherapy, became world famous. And this anecdote happens towards the last phase of his life. He was elderly, he was staying alone, and by that time, land telephones had come into existence. One midnight, when Frankl was about to sleep, his land phone rang. He attended the phone, and there was a young lady at the other end. That lady told him, Doctor, I want to end my life today. I feel that there's no point in living. Nobody likes me. I'm alone. I plan to kill myself. What is the most painless way to exit from this world? That was a question for that lady. Frankel asked her why she was contemplating suicide. She mentioned a lot of scenarios in, this, in her life. Frankel spent around one hour explaining to her why she shouldn't commit suicide. Trying to point out hundreds of new things in her life which could give a little bit of hope, including her three-year-old daughter who was very much alive and along with her. After listening to Frankel for around one hour, that lady finally told him, Okay, doctor, I think I should not end my life. I'm not going to kill myself. Frankel felt extremely fulfilled because at midnight he was able to save the life of a human being. And what happened after that was the real story. Around three months later, Frankel was invited for a public talk. And after returning from the public talk, this particular young lady came and introduced herself. Doctor, do you remember me? I was the person who troubled you at midnight three months ago. And Frankel was really surprised, personally surprised because it is not usual for psychiatrists to be acknowledged at public places from their clients, right? So Frank was initially apprehensive about that lady, but on listening to what she said, he felt very happy. And he asked a question to that lady, okay, we had discussed about so many reasons why you shouldn't end your life. Which of those reasons I told you 
actually prompted you from not committing suicide? That lady looked at the isoprangal and smiled and told, Doctor, none of the reasons you told was the reason for me refraining from suicide. Frankel was startled. Then what? Then why you didn't end your life at that point? The lady told, it was because of the fact that a person who I haven't met even once in my life was willing to spend one hour of his precious time at God-forsaken hours at midnight, talking to me, listening to me, understanding me, trying to convince me why I should survive in this world. A world in which human beings like you are there, who are willing to listen to me, I thought, it's a good world. There will be more people like you, and I'm not making an intelligent decision in exiting from this world. And so, I did not come. Frankel goes ahead and says that it may not be your intellectual abilities, it may not be your achievements and accolades you've gathered around your years of academic pursuit that is going to touch the life of another human being. Simple presence, willingness to listen, willingness to just understand another human being without judging him. That is probably the best human virtue. And if you develop that virtue, you have already found a purpose in your life. So just keep Victor Frankl's messages in your mind and all the other things which I have told you. Always remember, whenever you are feeling low, understand that there are people willing to assist you in this world. Go and talk to your close friend. If your friend is unable to solve your issues, Go and talk to a teacher who is mentoring you. And if still the teacher is finding it difficult, get a professional help. Definitely, definitely, you will live in this world for a very long period of time and you will contribute your best to the world wherever you go, wherever you live. So thank you very much for your extremely patient listening.